Mushroom girls, do you, yeah, when they get the yeah. rainbow, yeah, the pony ears, do you think they lose their human ears, or? Yes. Uh, <laughs> 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 I, was say, if you got I just felt like I needed to give a decisive answer to that yeah. question. <laughs> you, you did well. Thank you. We will now take it as canon. <laughs> right. <laughs> I have spoken. Three, two, one, sink. Three, two, one, sink. You're good. Perfect. So, shall we? We're good for now? Yeah. Alrighty, so hello and welcome to another iteration of the Barcast. We have another very special guest with us. We have Kelly Sheridan. Hi! Hi there, nice to meet you. Um, thank you very much for taking time to come on here. Thank you for having me. I grew some special ears just for the occasion. Perfect, <laughs> awesome. Now, we are a user-submitted podcast, so we take questions from the whole wide internet. Oh, cool. And we, while we normally try to make our guests miserable, that will be the case this time. Oh, thanks, super. So... We have a couple of general questions, and one, we always start with the most controversial one, and it is, who is best mommy? <sighs> See, I'm really fickle, so I change mm-hmm. my mind all the time, mm-hmm. but I think best pony of main six, Fluttershy. Mm-hmm. All right. Best pony in general, maybe Maud. I really enjoy Maud. Best creature, Gummy. Yes. I like it. Yeah, the, that trio is the that is the only. It's a good trio, today. right? It's a good trio. Right. I feel confident about that answer. If you ask me tomorrow, I might have a different answer. <laughs> that is the only trinity right now. <laughs> okay, excellent. Awesome, Perfect. awesome. We are back again now. A mo- another more tailored question in this case. So, you have an extensive history with Barbie. It seems. I do. So, how does your time with Barbie compare to your time with MLP in this case? Well, they're very different projects, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think Barbie probably appeals mostly only to the target demographic. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they're they're beautiful movies, and they were really fun to do. It was a lot of responsibility, mm-hmm. kind of being the lead of all of those shows. Mm-hmm. Um, and and because they're standalone movies, there's no character progression. So right. Barbie's kind of the same. More or less the same person each mm-hmm. movie, and she learns more or less the same lesson each movie. And of course, playing Starlight is completely different. Mm-hmm. She starts in and starts at one place and grows and changes, and is still growing and changing. So, mm-hmm. um, I don't necessarily prefer one over the other because Barbie movies were really exciting to make. They were a lot of fun to make, but uh, very different in terms of how you would approach the character. Right. I think not as much of a diverse group of fans either I assume yeah yeah I have um, I meet parents a lot or used to back in the day when I was doing it more often but to meet parents said oh my kid loves Barbie you have to meet them I said your kid isn't going to know who I am (laughs) when they're four Barbie's a real person to them she's a real person so they introduce you know their child to this short Canadian brunette this is Barbie (laughs) it's like oh you are not Barbie so yeah that's cool um, and you, in the topic of Starlight Glimmer, in that case, probably one of the more well-known characters in the series by this point. Um, given the chance to play her all this time by now, what do you feel is your general opinion based on where she's come from versus where she's ended up now and her prominent role? Well, I think um, if you see where she was at in season five, obviously um, she had a lot, a lot to learn and a lot to learn in terms of letting go of the need to control, letting go of the her first impulse being solving everything with magic. Mm-hmm. And then in season six, you see her make a lot of mistakes and learn a lot of lessons and make friends and change that way. And also kind of gain the confidence back in terms of like, okay, I can use magic now and, and not spiral into a dark hole again. Um, so... I think that's kind of where she was at at season seven and now season eight. I mean, obviously I can't talk about it too much, but mm. she's a guidance counselor now. So now she's helping other ponies with their problems, creatures, mm. make friends. And so she just keeps evolving and changing, which is super exciting as mm. an actor to be able to experience that right. through a character. No, absolutely. And yeah. on, a, on a slight follow-up to that, do you feel that the lessons that she or her character teaches either implicitly or explicitly are... Do you feel they're conveyed well enough? Do you feel that they 
that they get their that she they get the message across. Starlet's pretty blunt, so yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think so. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. She's pretty. Oftentimes, she sort of explicitly states in, in, if she's trying to teach someone something or if she's trying to have someone else experience something, she says what it is. Mm-hmm. And if she's experiencing a lesson herself, um, I think she's pretty self-realized. Like once she actually learns it, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. she's not she's not an oblique mm-hmm. character, which is another reason I really like her. No, and I happen to agree. And when it comes to MOP as a whole, whether it be with Starlight or any other character that you happen to have played, what do you feel was your most memorable moment working with the show? Ooh, there's a bunch. Any particular that stand out in your mind? Um, I loved uh, doing the entire episode of Hearth's Warming Tale because it was fun to be able to revisit evil mm-hmm. Starlight, mm-hmm. some of her nasty sides. I'm still hoping that we get some kind of flashback episode so we get to, I get to kind of play her as a bad guy again. I don't want her to be bad again, but it'd be kind of fun to play her bad again. Um, and uh, that was my first big song on the show, I would say. I mean, Our Town was big, but not as vocally challenging as Say Goodbye to the Holidays was. And I was really proud of myself for that song. I'm a nervous singer and didn't have a lot of confidence about it, but they let me do it. So so I think that was one of the experiences that I felt like, oh, wow, like I can do this. So, But there have been a lot of moments that were mm-hmm. pretty great. Right. Awesome. Yeah. So I'm assuming you and the entire cast had a lot of fun with that particular song. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. Now, another possibly slightly more controversial question. Do you like bagels? I'm one of those people who doesn't eat gluten. Mm. So, yes, I love bagels, but bagels don't love me. Ah. So, Why do you ask? No. Well, just because. People were just wondering. <laughs> they felt it was very, very Bagels, no. Prudent. I do. I do. I don't know if I love bagels. I love cream cheese. And so bagels are just kind of like a conveyance system for yeah to, to eat cream, cream cheese. cheese. Okay, yeah. so it's a guilty pleasure. Yeah, in that sense. yeah. awesome. <laughs> so now we also saw that you did. Oh, how much time we get? Yeah, we have. Yeah, how many how more questions later? Do we have? We we have twelve minutes roughly. Okay, probably less. Ten. Perfect. Okay. Now we also saw that you did a lot of work for some anime in the early two thousands. Yeah. Yeah, it was really, really cool to see, actually. I honestly had no idea in the beginning. And do, based on your experience with that, do you feel there's a very, there are very prominent differences or similarities between um, Western and Eastern anime, for example? I haven't seen a lot of Western anime, to be honest. Um, uh, if you're talking about dubbed recording, I don't necessarily know what the difference would be, would, would be between Eastern and Western productions, because most of the dubbed recording I've done has been Japanese or Korean or Chinese okay. productions. Um, and But they are very different than the um, other cartoons I do, which we call pre-lay, mm-hmm. which is when they um, pre-lay the audio track down and then animate to it, which is what MLP would be. And the recording process for those two things are very different. So mm-hmm. when you're dubbing something, it's just you alone in a booth. You often don't get a chance to read the entire script. You just say your lines it's just you and the engineer, and you're trying to match your performance to something that's already been animated, so it's a lot more um, constructive. And then with Prelay, all of us are in a room, interacting with each other, and there's ad-libbing that happens, and um, you're a lot more kind of free in terms of your performance. And I like both of them. I sort of like the technical challenge of dubbing, mm-hmm. but I think doing Prelay stuff is a bit more fun in terms of performance, because you have a lot more room to play around. Certainly a little more, certainly more social. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and so it's fun to watch other people work as well. Right. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Um, so another kind of off-the-wall question. What do you feel is the optimum number of ears for a face? Four, obviously. Four. Interesting. Interesting. What were the, what were the other two? Oh, oh. Yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, technically, they're not on my face. They're sort of like around my face, but four, of course. <laughs> It'd be silly. <laughs> well, yeah. Obviously, I'm not in the know here. All right. So four is best. Perfect. <laughs> now we are we are kind of on the tail end of BabsCon right now. So what do you feel? Either if you have anything coming up, or what do you feel was either the most memorable moment here, or will or will be 
you'll be looking forward to the most? Um, the kids. Meeting the mm-hmm. kids was really great. So we had a like a big panel on was that yesterday? On Saturday. Mm-hmm. And all the kids sat in the front row and the kids asked the most challenging questions. One kid asked, What has been your greatest regret? <laughs> Another kid. Can you remember some of the other things? They were so funny. Like, they did not pull any punches. They were awesome. They were really awesome. And then we went to visit them. Like the voice actors went to visit them in the kids' room mm. after. And they just, that's the thing I love about kids. They will tell you what they think. Mm. They are like no holds barred. So they're great. Hanging out with the kids was probably my highlight. Most candid people on earth. Yeah, they're not being careful. They're not nervous around you. Zero they will perfect. say what they think. So mm-hmm. I love that. Awesome. Yeah. It's perfect. So let's see here. Um, I guess kind of a little bit of a check-in question. So on a scale of yes to yes, how much do you regret coming here? Specifically for this interview. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> No regrets. No regrets. If that kid had asked me yesterday, what's your greatest regret? That would not be my answer. I, uh, I'm enjoying my time. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so let's see. So you've, you've obviously been with MLP for a little while, yeah. more than a little while, actually. Um, you've seen the show progress from over the seasons, over even the generations. Yeah. What do you feel are the some of the best changes that the uh, show has undergone in its evolution, as it were? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think because a lot of, I think the fandom has had a lot of influence on the types of stories that are told in the show, and you see the writers and the creators walking this line between what's going to be accessible to kids and then what's also going to appeal to the fandom and then what else, you know, also just what kind of stories they want to tell. And so I think things like the 100th anniversary episode, you know, there are these love letters to the fandom that I don't think would necessarily be there otherwise if it was just a kid's show. Mm. So I think that's been really exciting. I think the fandom has kind of changed the course of the show. I also, I mean, this is just my personal opinion, but I don't think we would have had as many seasons as we have, had it not been for the fandom. Um, Because there's this sort of um, practice in children's animation, they call it um, evergreen. So you create one or two seasons of a show, and the kids watch them, and then they age out of the show, and you get a new generation Mm -hmm. of kids in watching. So oftentimes it's not worth companies while to make six or seven or eight seasons of something, unless it's wildly popular. Uh So I think that's another kind of gift that the fandom has given us and all the people that work on the show is they mm. keep making them because people keep watching them and there's a demand for them. Right. So, so I hope he's kind of a little more unique in that regard. I think so, yeah. I mean, of course, other shows mm. have done the same thing, Certainly. but yeah. So, but more than eight seasons usually, you don't always see that Yeah, too you often. don't, you really don't. It's a, it's a big gift, so. Mm. Do you feel there's a lot more fan influence in this show as opposed to other shows that either you've worked on or that you're familiar with? I think probably the most in terms of the stuff I've worked on personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. It's unique. Awesome. Yeah. Sweet. Um, You did, you did, it looks like you did a few uh, roles for some video games. Um, Do you, do you, do you play? And if so, do you have a favorite video game? I don't really play a lot of video games. I play a lot of board games. Mm. Yeah, so I don't play a lot of video games. What's your favorite board game? Um, ooh, my favorite. Catan's a pretty good classic. Mm. Catan's pretty good. Um, I was actually given two board games at this con, oh. Tiny Epic Galaxies, which is great if you've never played that. That's a really good travel game. You can play the uh, solitaire version. You can play up to five people. Mm. Every kind of aspect of it is really fun. That's a new fun one. Mm, I have this fantastic game called Ladies and Gentlemen that a friend gave me for my birthday a couple of years ago. It's super misogynistic. It's really funny. And the premise <laughs> is... Um, We're going to get along with it. It's great. And it's kind of a... Ro- it has a role-playing element to it. So you... Um, the premise is that the... 
you play in a team and you're a lady and a gentleman and we always swap genders around and everything. Mm -hmm. So everybody just plays whoever they want and you, um, but you play separately and the lady's job is to go and acquire the most beautiful outfit for the ball at the end of the week and the outfit pieces of the outfit Mm -hmm. are worth different points. And the gentleman's job is to go to the stock exchange and make money and he pays for the outfit. So you have to convince your gentleman like what's worth buying and what isn't. And there's certain information you can't divulge to each other, but then there's this role playing aspect that comes along with it. That's really fun so it's basically like 10 of my friends screaming at each other in a room it's really 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 great especially when you see like your 200 pound like football player friend be like i need this tiara for the ball or i'm not gonna win (laughs) yeah it's great it's really great i guess if there are any photos and possibly alcohol involved as well That usually is the case. And you can drink whatever you want as long as you drink it out of a very fancy glass. So you can have, like, Gatorade, but you have to drink it out of a champagne flute or something. You pick it up, right? Of course. Always. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. And um, upcoming projects. Yes. All right. So if you were able to tell, do you have any any information of any exciting project that you are potentially going to be involved with? Yeah, um, I'm working, I just finished recording a new um, preschool series called 16 Hudson Street with Big Bad Boo, and Andrea Libman is on that show, Uh, Vincent Tong is on that show, Marika Hendricks, um, a whole bunch of MLP people, Mm -hmm. and Vancouver favorites, and it's really, really cute. It's a show about a bunch of kids who live in a brownstone, and I think it's New York or Brooklyn or something. I'm not sure if they say exactly where it is, but that's kind of, you know, where the look of the show. And it's just a morality tale show. Like, the different kids learn different lessons um, every week, like how not to be scared when your dad, um, you know, leaves you with a babysitter. Just, like, lessons that little kids go through or how, yeah. Um, and the brownstone is made up from different families of different ethnicities. There's um, same-sex parents raising an adopted mm-hmm. kid, and it's a preschool show. It's really well animated and it's super cute and really well written, and I'm very proud of it. So that's the thing I'm most proud of right now. Perfect. Yeah. That sounds awesome. Yeah. It really does. Um, and I believe that is all the time we have for today. Ah. <laughs> so I want to t- I want to thank you again very much for taking the time to talk with thank us. Thank you, my pleasure. So thank you very much for that. This has been the Barcast, and we are signing off for BabsCon. Bye, four ears. Four ears.